This is a time of fascinating and near cataclysmic change in journalism. So my hunch is all of tonight's guests, somewhere deep inside, wish they were 22 years old again and embarking on a new career in journalism rather than looking back at the 160 years of experience they've combined to have in the rearview mirror. The fact is, these four have surely left big footprints during their journalistic careers. And with that, we welcome, in alphabetical order, Tom Clark, whose last gig was host of The West Block on Global TV. John Cruikshank, who last year retired as publisher of the Toronto Star. Gord Martineau, who anchored City TV's news for 39 years. And Jane Tabor, whose last assignment was the Women in Politics beat for the Globe and Mail. I am delighted to welcome you four. How syrupy should I get here? Tit <laughs> titans of journalism around the table. I think you should point out that the yeah. bulk of those 160 years was Crookshank. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. We're the youngsters. Well, yeah, yeah. We're going to do a bit of looking back, obviously, on this program, but I also want to do a bit of analyzing what's going on right now because I know you all have thoughts on what's happened to the business that we have all spent so much time in. Gordon, let's start with you. What made you want to be a journalist in the first place? I knew when I was 14 years old what I wanted to do. I know a lot of young people don't know what they want to do until later on in life. Some people go through their entire lives not really knowing or doing what they wanted to do. But I knew at 14 what I wanted to do, How? and I went ahead and did it. How'd you know? I don't know. It's, it kind of came to me when my mother would come home from work. I was a latchkey kid. And so I would fill her in on all the details that had happened during the day. I would listen to the news and, you know, watch the news reels on TV. And I would give her the whole spiel while she was making dinner. And, and uh, it just, it was something, I think it made me feel important in her eyes. Hmm. And uh, so I continued with that. John, how about you? Um, well, I was working in a factory and I had a girlfriend who was working in a newsroom. Um, and I realized she had a much better life than I did. Um, so she decided that she wanted to go down to, uh, to, to Harvard, do the journalism program there. But you had to write an autobiography about why you wanted to go. And so I wrote that for her. And she got accepted. And I got a job. Very cool. Jane? Well, I'm a lot younger than you guys, and so, <laughs> so I just want to say that when I was easy for you. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a, a young person, I was watching the uh, the leadership conventions, the federal leadership conventions on TV in '67 and '68, and I was inspired by the people who were interviewing the politicians. So this is Bob Stanfield and Pierre Trudeau. Exactly, mm. and at that point, I got I got really interested in the side of the, the, who are those people. I want to be like them, and I want to get. In, I, I, I liked the political sphere. I liked the competition and the, and the idea of that. And then I got into Peter Newman's books. And Peter Newman would talk about what politics behind the scenes. And he would bring politics to life by talking about the players, the people, and who they were. And I, and I really got inspired by that. And so you know, I ended up on Parliament Hill. <laughs> Tom, what made you want to be a journalist? Well, I think it all started that time. I was looking at that black and white TV <laughs> as a young boy. And I looked up, and there was Gord Martineau. And I said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> nice try, young boy. <laughs> but seriously, uh, folks. But seriously, folks. <laughs> so three reasons. Um, I was intensely curious as a young boy. I really inspired to be curious by an uncle of mine who was in journalism, Greg Clark, who was a writer who, when we were up at our cottage, and we would walk from the cottage to the dock, and Greg would say, what did you see on that walk from the cottage down to the dock? Mm -hmm. And it was a bit of a training process. So curiosity, number one. Number two, I love telling stories. I always love telling stories. There was no event that happened that required only a sentence or two. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a beginning, middle, and end to absolutely every event that happened in life. I probably got that from Greg. And keep in mind, too, I'm fifth generation in journalism, so it was in the family. Mm -hmm. uh, J.T. Clark was along with Joe Atkinson, started the modern Toronto Star. And uh, all of our generations have been involved. And then thirdly, and probably most importantly, I really didn't want to work for a living. <laughs> so, so this seemed to be perfect. Yeah. I've had that same thought many times in my career. One of these, one of these days, I'm going to have to get a real job. Yeah. 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 Well, there is an old sort of cliche in this business that it all started at a 50-watt radio station in yeah. Sault Ste. Marie yeah. or something yeah. like that. So let's go back to that first job. What, you, you knew from 14 you wanted that job. Yep. What, in fact, was it? Uh, it was radio. I wanted to be in radio. And I remember applying to radio stations when I was... Uh, 17 years old, sending tapes out. But I had them made on what was called a half-track machine. So every time you made a mistake, you'd have to rewind, do it over again. <laughs> yeah. But that meant you put another track on there. So when the tape was played back, there were 14 voices on it. And so I'd sent those to a number of radio stations and never got an answer. 
And uh, finally, I called a radio station in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, CFDR, which no longer exists. Um, and, and said, look, you know, uh, you got anything going on? They said, well, we're looking for an all-night newsreader. If you want to come down and audition, feel free to do so. I had $95 in the bank because I just finished my summer job at CP Express, got on a plane and bought a round-trip ticket. I never used the second half of the ticket. Uh, for some reason, uh, they foolishly gave me the job because I didn't even know what a microphone looked like. So you are 17 years old on air for the first time? No, 18. 18 then? Yes, I had just turned 18. Huh. And um, th my first uh, newscast was a half-hour Benerloin newscast on the half-hour. And so I, I did it. And uh, I was sitting in a studio with the DJ. He swung the mic over to me. I did my thing. And then after I finished it, and I booted it all over the place. <laughs> and I said to him, geez, I really made a mess of that. Yeah. But it, the mic was still hot. Oh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. It was a steep learning curve. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Jane, do you remember the first job, John? Oh, yeah. yeah. First job after second year journalism. It was for a weekly newspaper in get this, Tabor, Alberta. And the, re uh -huh. and, the, and the newspaper was called the Tabor Times. And I knew that I had an in because it was the same name as my last name. It was my last name. And, I, and I, so I applied. And it was like a novelty kind of hire uh, <laughs> because it was Tabor working for the Tabor Times. But it was the only offset press in the town. So as well as doing headlines, photography, developing my own pictures, almost typesetting and everything else, I was putting together report cards for the town of Tabor because they were printed on the press. And so that was it was it was great. I was living in a small town in southern Alberta. Everybody knew me, great stories and it, you learned how to manage as we had to do on Parliament Hill, Tom, the, the very small kind of village-like atmosphere and, and all of your you know, sources and everything. So it was a great learning curve, a, a great education for me. Where did it all start for you? Kingston League Standard. Oh. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. It was just so much fun. What made it so? Um, I met my wife there. Uh, that was important. Um, so this wasn't the person who went to Harvard. No, it was her, it was it was <laughs> oh, her right. close friend. Oh, um, oh, yeah, well, that sounds more interesting. It was uh, yeah, it was a fascinating time. <laughs> we were all young, right? <laughs> but it was great, and and you know I I had to do everything from jailbreaks, and in Kingston that's yeah. a big local story, mm -hmm. to capsizing of you know. Um, uh, yachts in the in the harbor. It was it was just it was just a wonderful wonderful time. Uh, stayed up all night once a week putting out the real estate section. There you go. Just yeah. all part of what you wound up doing. What was your first gig? Well, believe it or not, it was on Parliament Hill, but it, it was a lot less glamorous than you might think. <laughs> um, I ended up working for a freelancer who went on to become a member of Parliament, Jeff Scott. Yep. You probably oh, yes. remember yeah. him, but from Hamilton. Back, yeah. From Hamilton, exactly. But back in the day. And this is before networks, before satellites, before any of the modern technology. What he would do on Parliament Hill is he had all these TV stations across the country lined up, and he would interview the local MP for the uh, local station. And uh, in those days, it was all film. And my job was to stand beside the camera, take the film, put it in a can, and write Regina on it, <laughs> and then put it in a pile. And then I'd go down to the bus station, and I'd make sure that Regina actually got to Regina. And, uh, if, if there were spelling mistakes. Well, right, or if Regina went to Prince Albert, then yeah. it was a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. And so I did that, um, and it worked out well. And the reason it worked out well was because one day Jeff didn't quite make it into work. And uh, it may have had something to do with the fact that his good buddy Rich Little was in town the night before, and they were in the heat of imitating John Diefenbaker and Lester <laughs> Pearson. It was a, quite a night. And I started asking the questions. And that was the first time that I actually got mm. to... Uh, and I said to the cameraman, who was a very nice guy, um, I said, listen, on this next one, and I think it was Prince Albert, I said, just go a little bit wider, will you? Show the MP and maybe a little bit of me as well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it started. And then I ended up going to Montreal after that, hmm. uh, working at CFCF. Your last places of employment are all going through fairly cataclysmic change right now. And I want to get into some discussion about that because there was a time when network television news or local news was a license to print money. There was a time when the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, all of the newspapers made a hell of a lot of money. And it isn't that way anymore, I don't have to tell all of you. John, I'm going to come to you first on this. First, I'm going to make you watch yourself on TV here. Oh. Here's you on CBC Radio not too long ago describing the pickle that the Toronto Daily Star now finds itself in today. 
Sheldon, roll it, please. When I came into the the business, now 40 years ago, believe it or not, uh, well, you'll believe it, but I don't. Um, <laughs> Uh, 75% of the, the, the revenues of newspapers came from advertising, and only 25% came from, from the subscription base. So it meant there was this massive subsidy of the cost of actually producing a newspaper that was, that was created by advertisers. So we, as subscribers, we never paid for the newspaper. We paid for just a little fraction of it. Now it's shifting. Because advertising is going elsewhere, a lot of it going to the web, a lot of it going to television. Um, it, what, it, what it means is subscribers are being forced really to pay the lion's share, or they will be in the future, forced to pay the lion's share of subscription costs. Will they do that when they can get things online? Well, and I, that, that's a big question. That's you and Neil Coxell on CBC Radio. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Do you know the answer yet? Yes. Oh. And the answer is no. <laughs> the answer is they will not pay. They will not. No. So what does that portend for the Toronto Star five or ten years from now? Well, um, it's, it's, it's much broader than the Toronto Star. Um, it's, it's, it's all newspapers. And we already know, um, because the CRTC reports this every year, I mean, local, local television news lost over $80 million in 2015. Um, so we are, we are in the midst of a profound, profound change in, in, in how the business case works. But the business case for, for newspapers has been, and this is, this is uh, fascinated me through so much of my career, it, it has been slowly being undermined since the dawn of television. I mean, literally, newspapers have been in decline since 1960, since, since the, uh, the development of the, of the, the first of the, of the networks. Um, but it's, it's taken a long time because of the, the, because of the natural resilience mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the institution. It's taken a long time to get to the point where the business case just doesn't work at all. So can you imagine a future where people get up in the capital city of this province and there is not a daily newspaper waiting at their front door for them? It's, it's what I can't imagine at this point is, is, is how the finances work. You know, it's, it's, it, it is very hard to imagine that, that people will, you know, they, they will continue to want that newspaper very much, but I don't know how it can be paid for. Do you still read The Star? I still read, of course. You get of it course. at your house? I get it at my house and the, and the, and the Globe and Mail as well, and The New York Times. So you actually read a hard copy of the papers? Yes, yes, because I'm most comfortable with that. But I, in addition to that, you know, obviously, read a tremendous amount more online, mm -hmm. um, you know. As, as we, we junkies do. Yeah. Uh, but the hard copy is, is over time, going away. You yeah. said the key word there, and that is online. Yeah. Yeah. That is the dawn of, of you know, the demise of, of uh, the situation that we now find ourselves in, whereas yeah. newspapers, radio and television are getting hammered yeah. mm -hmm. by yeah. online. Yeah. As long as you have the floor, I want to come to you next. Sure. Because you were, uh, listen, I have no hesitation saying it, you were involved in probably the most revolutionary, groundbreaking mm -hmm. local newscast in the history of Canada. No question. Yeah. And you want to see what you looked like way back when? No. <laughs> you don't, you don't have a choice. Where, where you don't have a choice, Mr. Mulligan. I'll, I'll guarantee you one thing. The tie, though not my tie, is as big as your head. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Go ahead, Sheldon. Let's roll it. City Pulse News. 90 minutes of news, weather, sports, and information. Our City Pulse news team's Chrome Metro, bringing you up to the second developments in consumer affairs, health, business, and entertainment. City Pulse News, the stories you need to know to understand Toronto. As City Pulse anchorman, I'm constantly challenged by the question, how is this show different? What makes it unique besides its length? I say without hesitation that it's our people-oriented, street-based mandate. It's laid out by executive producer Moses Neimer. You know, what's, <laughs> what's scary is Go you... Go ahead, laugh at you if no, you No, no, no. <laughs> I was going to say, what's scary is you don't look a hell of a lot different. Mm. You really don't. Mm. Uh, what was it like launching that? It was amazing because this was, as you said, completely revolutionary. Nobody had ever attempted anything like this in the world, not just in Canada. Mm. Uh, we were total 100% videotape, whereas the other stations like CTV, Global, uh, CBC, well, Global was was brand Global. new then. CBC, right. um, we're all shooting 16 millimeter on old Bolex cameras. Film, and, yeah, and so it was totally different. And we got rid of the anchor desk. No one had ever done that before. We were walking, talking. Um, 
It was, it was an amazing place to be because you never knew what was going to happen one day to the next. It was an idea factory. So anybody who had an idea was, the, the idea was go out and shoot it, let's see it. You, know, you were never discouraged when you had something new to say, whereas today that, that no longer exists. Don't and take so, this the wrong way, Tom, but they also had people whose last names were not Clark, but rather uh, Moskowski, well, for example. I remember <laughs> sitting with, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I sat with Moses Neimer at the Pierre Cafe in New York City in 1977. And he said, this is what I want to do. And the, at the end of the day, your primary questions are all local. Your house, your neighborhood, your family, your kids, your job. So he said, we're going to cover the backyard, the front yard. Whereas you could take any station, anytime, anywhere, and they all had the same lead. Mm -hmm. And they all gave you basically the same newscast. If you played the shell game, it didn't matter which one you were watching. You basically got the same lineup every day. We were just going to tear that apart. We did. They laughed their asses off at us. Uh, the first couple of years, but then the changes we forced in the marketplace, they stopped laughing pretty quickly. That theme music summed it up. I mean, that's the theme music yeah. from Rocky, and you guys were the, <laughs> were the underdogs who punched above your weight, weren't yep, you? Yep, absolutely, yeah. and we enjoyed doing it. We, were, we thumbed our noses at convention. Why did you stay for 39 years minus a, a few days when you went to Global? For a few days, but yeah. then came right I was back. There for, I was on air for seven days there. Yeah. Um, why did I stay? Because I thought when I signed on there, and the place was a madhouse, it really was, but it was kind of exciting, it was electric. And I thought, I either know what I'm doing at this point in my life or I don't. If it fails, I'll go somewhere else. You know, there are jobs open in broadcasting, as you know, you, I'll, I'll catch on somewhere else. But I never, uh, I never went anywhere else, except for that, that uh, hiccup at Global. But um, it, it, I thought to myself, the moment this becomes not fun anymore and becomes a job, then maybe I'll bail out of it. But it never became a job. It was always fun. It was fun for 39 years. Oh, yes. Every day you go in there, and you know, in news, as you know, you never know what's going to happen from day to day. <laughs> the, the great thing about our jobs is that it's so exciting. It's new every day. So why did you stop doing it? Uh, because I was asked to leave. Why? I would suggest to you that it was money, uh, but, you know, there was nothing scandalous about it, I can tell you that. Um, my departure was quite unceremonious. I uh, walked out in January, or sorry, February 29th, uh, 2016, did my last newscast, walked out of the building and never went back. Um, and the relations between me and Rogers are rather frosty, shall we say. People who host programs need a chance to say goodbye to the people that they have established yes. a relationship with over the years. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? No. Why not? I didn't want to do the, oh, gee, I'm going, see you later, gang, and here's, this is my life. I didn't want one of those because I think they're kind of phony anyway. You know, you're leaving, you're leaving. Just go. But um, there were other circumstances there that I'm actually legally not permitted to speak of that took place that, um, that I think don't look uh, favorably on the company that I used to work for. There's so much more I want to ask about this, but I probably shouldn't, right? I should probably just leave it. Call Michael Levine. <laughs> <laughs> you know him. <laughs> He's my uh, legal counsel. He can tell you all about it. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Well, all right. Uh, for our purposes today, I'll just leave it there. Mm. I do need to say that actually one guy at this table did get a chance to say goodbye to his viewers, and I thought did so in an incredibly classy and well done way, and that's you, Mr. Clark. And in case you don't recall what you said. I don't. <laughs> well, because it's an emotional moment, yeah. we'll play a bit of it. Sheldon, roll it, please. Welcome back. Well, after six seasons of the West Block and 45 years in journalism, I'm stepping back. This is my last broadcast. This profession has given me an incredible life. I have traveled the world and I've seen the best of it. I've certainly seen the worst of it. Few people have the privilege of watching history as it's being made, and I was one of the happy few. To be there when the Berlin Wall came down, when the tanks rolled into Tiananmen Square, to be among the first to see and report on a famine in Ethiopia that literally changed the way the world reacted to crises in the third world. Tom, you saw so much, so why stop doing it? Well, later on in that piece, I said that one of the reasons was that because I had had such uh, a wonderful life, courtesy of this business, that I really felt that it was necessary for the older guys, which I suddenly became, 
to move out of the way so that younger people could move up. Look, if we have any hope of keeping good journalism alive in this country, we can't block the younger people. We can't block the experience that they can have. Uh, and I really believe that, because I got to tell you, when I was in this business, many, many times in this business, I did see older people who had found themselves in comfortable positions, either in bureaus or behind anchor desks, who just stayed and stayed and stayed and blocked the progress of, of the business. We weren't getting infusion of new blood. We weren't getting new ideas on the table like we had at City TV back in the day. So I always said to myself, when that moment comes, and I hope I recognize it, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be one of those guys. Well, let me follow up on that. Yeah. Was it you who recognized it, or was someone who told you now is the time? No, I, you know, to be very honest with you, it was me who recognized mm -hmm. it. I had every intention, as did my employer at the time, of, re, as we say, re-upping the contract. And uh, I could have been there happily for another four or five years. Um, no, but it was me that decided that uh, if, if I was going to do one thing for my profession, that was what I was going to do. And I know it sounds corny and I know it sounds a little self-serving, but it's actually true. And, um, you know, because how can you have a life like that where you were able to tell stories big and small from people important and non-important, but it really is, you know, to use that old phrase, you know, a front seat or front row seat mm -hmm. to history. I viewed it also as, uh, you know, as writing or weaving the fabric of my time. And um, how can you have all of that and deny it to somebody else? I don't think that's possible. If, if, if you believe in the business, I don't think that's possible to do. Okay, your turn. You ready? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because <laughs> you, you not just wrote for the Globe and Mail, but there was a time when you were doing work on CTV as well. That's right, I had two jobs, yeah. Co-hosting yeah. Question Period, the, uh, the show that looked at Parliament Hill. And I, I, I say this with, with love and admiration. You were a pit bull as an interviewer. <laughs> and I want to show a little of your work. Here's you with Bob Ray. He's no longer Premier of Ontario. He's vying for the Liberal leadership now with Michael Ignatieff. Mm -hmm. And you've got him on question period. And um, you're talking about possibility of bringing down Stephen Harper with this coalition of the Bloc and the NDP. And um, well, let's let it speak for okay. itself. Go ahead, Sheldon. Here we go. You have carved out an interesting territory for yourself. You have decided that you are going to be the champion of this uh, of a coalition government. The polls are showing Canadians don't buy this coalition government. They think it's bad. And you also want to defeat the government as soon as you possibly can. Are you in dangerous territory here, Mr. Ray? You're setting up some, you know, for the Liberal Party, you're setting up some coalition with the NDP and, and, and the Bloc. I think it's important for us to provide an alternative to Mr. Harper. And I think the only effective way we can do that is through the kind, of st the kind of stability that we've negotiated with the New Democratic Party uh, and the kind of parliamentary agreement that we've established with the bloc. It's better than the Russian roulette that Mr. Harper's playing with every day. And what every about day. The, it's his way or the highway. What about, every the day Russian, what about the Russian roulette you're playing with the Liberal Party? Because some people are saying you're selfish. This is your end run to become leader because you know you don't have the support within the party. So you're trying to lead the coalition and then thereby defeat the government and become prime minister. I, I think, I don't, who... I'd be interested to know who would say such a thing. I mean, you may have people who would say that in your ear, but perhaps one day you'll tell us who they are. Uh, okay. Were on it. The, 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 day, the day has come. Who are those people that you were playing? It was me. Okay. Yeah. Tom, Tom was whispering in my ear. He, he, was, he was the first. I might have rethought that outfit, but anyway. That, <laughs> um, that, okay, that's Jane Tabor at work. Your style was to get a little chippy and in people's faces from time to time. Yeah, How come? From time to time. Well, just because you only have a certain amount of time in television, unlike print, and you have to get them going. So, you know, you have to, you have to sort of poke at them a little bit. Would you ever have heard back from, let's say, for example, a Bob Ray after the interview was over saying, boy, you sure were nasty with me out no. there. No. No? No, no. They don't do that. Bob Ray's a professional. He doesn't do stuff like that. So nobody thought you crossed the line ever? No. No. No, I don't think. I, I can't remember anybody ever, ever saying that to me. Maybe some of his people might have said something, but not Mr. Ray himself. Now, that just looked, Jane, like so much fun. It why, was. It so, was why, really <laughs> so why would you want to step aside from this business then? Well, you know, it, it, a bit to Tom's point, I'm not as nice as stepping aside because I want younger people to take my job. <laughs> um, but what a lot of it was for me, I'd been in 30 plus years. Um, I wanted uh, not to be, uh, I wanted to keep liking my job and I didn't want to get to the point where I hated it. 
Yeah, because I see a lot of people who are very bitter in the business, and I feel like they're phoning it in a little bit, and I didn't want to be that person. I wanted to leave on my own steam, and I wanted to take what I had learned in journalism and, and contacts that I have and in the network that I have established and that kind of thing, and use it in another way and see, like, challenge myself, see what, I can, see what else I can do, see if I can do something else. Because I can walk into any newsroom and know how to do a story. I just have to meet the, the people and, and figure out the culture of the place. But what I'm doing now at, at National Public Relations is totally different than what I was doing as a journalist. And it's not the flip side of it. There's a lot more involved. Well, I was going to get to this later, but since yeah. you raised it, you know, th there, there are obviously some people in journalism who think that you, and you, because you've gone over to that world of consulting right. as well, yeah you know, have moved to the dark side. It's not the dark side. Like, I don't feel slimy. I don't feel that I'm helping people who are creepy or in any way, you know, misguided. I, I just, I, I feel that I'm, I'm, I'm helping actually a lot of women. It's really interesting that I wrote a lot about women and women in the spotlight, and I'm helping now a lot of women CEOs with their sort of brands and their style and their presentation and some of the issues that they have because there is still a double standard <laughs> with women. And, as, as we learned yeah. when, we wrote your, when we read your pieces. Yeah, yeah. Steve, can I say something? Please. That, that the way you handle Bob Ray yeah. is a classic example <laughs> of why good journalism has to be protected. It is under siege right now. You asked him the hard questions. You asked him basically the questions that a lot of audience members probably had in their heads. Mm -hmm. And this is why journalism needs to be protected. A classic example. Mm -hmm. How about you, Tom? <laughs> You've, uh, do you... Uh, there must have been a part of you at one point who considered consulting and public relations and government relations, that kind of thing, the dark yeah. side. And yet you're there now. Yeah. yeah, no, that's true. And it's amazing how your views change once you cross <laughs> over the other side of the road. I, like Jane, I, you know, what I've discovered about this is that I am doing today what I always did as a journalist. I pay attention to public policy. I dig deep into public policy. I talk now to people who shape the discussion of public policy in this country. And I think that, so it, it, it's using all the skills that I had as a journalist, and not for evil purposes. Exactly. It is still involved in the public life of the country, yeah. but in a different way. And frankly, it allows you, and I'm, Jane, you'd support me on this, it allows you to have the feeling that you're helping to shape the debate yeah. in a way that is positive. Mm -hmm. We, you know, just because you cross the road doesn't mean all of a sudden you turn into Montgomery Burns and you know, exit, <laughs> release the hounds. You know, you don't do that. Hmm. So I, I'm finding quite the contrary, that, that this is actually an incredibly positive way of contributing to the public debate. And there's so much misunderstanding about journalism, which is, is something that I found uh, being where I am now, that, uh, that there's a lot of, there, people are afraid of journalists, and they shouldn't be. People They're, in the business world. People in the business world, they should be out there. They should be more, they should yeah. be more transparent. They should be more accountable. Mm -hmm. If I can help them with that and, and get to some comfort level where they can actually tell a great story, that's positive for everybody. It's positive for They freak for out when they see a camera. They well, just, they well, do, they get the, very, yes. very intimidated. And, yeah. and it's difficult for a lot of business people to not be intimidated when the big eye is looking at them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's so powerful when it, when it yeah. is and when they can tell their story. Mm -hmm. I want to ask each of you now about yourselves coming at it from this angle. That there are few people as important in the world of journalism when they walk into a room as the publisher of the Toronto Star. I mean, you walk in the room and the star is here and people go, Oof, okay, got to make a good impression on this guy. And John, you can't walk into any room anymore as the Toronto Star. It turns out I'm not as funny as I once was. <laughs> Well, or as smart. Or <laughs> I never had that pretension. <laughs> no, but I, I want to ask about that. There are obviously people in this business who derive a huge part of their self-esteem from the title after their name. Yeah. You don't have that title anymore. Yeah. What's happened to your self-esteem? I, I, I'm holding up. You know, <laughs> my therapist says I'm doing well. <laughs> um, no, it, 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 for me, really for the last 20 years, uh, about half my career, I was intensely aware that, that the, the, the business model for news was deteriorating. Uh, I could see it in, in, in print. Um, television news began to deteriorate as a, as a business really the moment that, that cable came along. Um, and that's when the, the numbers start to decline uh, and, and the average age starts to, starts to grow. So I really spent most of that time, from the time that I was working in Chicago to Cayman, I ran CBC for a year, CBC News, uh, and then, and then at the Star, I was 
really spent all of that time committed to trying to create new models for news. Mm -hmm. And that was what was most exciting for me. Uh, that isn't where the, um, you know, where the, where the personal, uh, you know, all the ego stuff came from. Um, but that's where the deeper satisfaction came in trying to solve those problems and, and finding attempts at, at, at getting at ways that would really engage audiences, especially younger audiences. Um, because, you know, I feel so deeply that, that this is tied up in a really profound way with, with who we are as citizens. And if we can engage people in thinking about the news and thinking about their daily lives uh, in, the, in that way, then, then we really are lost. And Gord, I couldn't agree more. This is such a tough time. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, because we also have these contrary political pressures that, yeah. that are discouraging people from doing that deeper mm -hmm. work. Um, so, I, you know, uh, losing the title, uh, it, it actually hasn't been a big deal. Um, I've continued on with, with the work. I did some work with Eddie Greenspan on the, the project he did on, on trying to think through journalism. Um, I've been. You're chairman of Canadian Press. I'm still co-chairman of Canadian Press with Philip Crawley. So it's mm -hmm. so it's uh, that's that's both uh, journalism and diplomacy. Um, <laughs> we still address him as my lord. That hasn't changed. Yeah. Gord, I'm going to come to you next on this because yeah. obviously you can't be on the air for 39 straight years, mm -hmm. anchoring the kind of newscast you did, and then one day, the next day, you're not. Mm -hmm. The blow to the ego has been what? It's not really a blow to the ego. What, what it is, is is a time of transition where you decide, OK, what am I going to do next? Am I going to do anything? Uh, so I've spent a couple of months uh, sitting in Florida, playing tennis, riding a bike, and generally starting to feel pretty good about myself, getting into really good physical shape. What comes in the future, I don't know. But I'm looking around now to see where I might fit in somewhere or, or maybe not even bother. Well, you're doing News Talk 1010 now, right? Yes. You're a weekly commentator on, on the yes. radio. Yeah. And you, how's that going for you? It's OK. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you, you're on a panel with uh, Evan Solomon uh, and some other, you know, very interesting people talking about the events of the day. And you get to really sometimes slam politicians and <laughs> because I, I've thrown off the shackles of not having an opinion about mm -hmm. anything. You can and be opinionated now, Yes, I can. And, uh, <laughs> Do you enjoy that freedom? Yeah, it's fun, <laughs> it, you know, because I'm rebellious to begin with. That's part of my persona. But, you know, it's always been in the closet when I've been on the air acting as a journalist. Uh, but now I don't have to abide by those rules. And we'll see what happens. Tom, how about you in that same regard? Again, you played the, the sort of neutral anchor reporter mm -hmm. for so many years. Mm -hmm. Now you 45. can 45. Yeah. Now you can sort of do and say what you want. And you're not on the air anymore. No. How are you, how you dealing with not being on the air anymore? Two things. Gord Martineau is always going to be Gord Martineau. Mm -hmm. For anybody who has lived in Toronto, uh, that's never going to go away. Jane Tabor is going to be Jane Tabor. Uh, John Crookshank. Even Steve Pakin is always going to be Steve Pakin. Heaven for Fend. <laughs> well, <laughs> we get too caught up with celebrity and notoriety in this business, and it is actually yeah. corrosive mm -hmm. to what we are trying to achieve. There was a period of time, especially in television, where that became... Uh, you know, the goal, that's what, you know, you wanted to become a star. And in Canada, the star system was not about movie stars, it was about TV news people. And it was very heady. I mean, it was, you know, you got great seats in restaurants and so on. But it always bothered me because I said, well, wait a minute, this is so counterintuitive yeah. to what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. So the fact that, you know, that I, for better or for worse, will always be myself, uh, I love it when people come up to me and say, you know what, I watch you every night. And, you know, I haven't been on for a couple of months. But anyway, that's fine. In their minds, I'm still on television. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't bother me. And it is liberating to be able to speak. I find, though, interestingly enough, after all those years of maintaining and forcing yourself to yeah. be on the one hand, on the other hand, and make sure you understand the totality of the argument, when the chains are finally lifted from you, guess what? You're still going, well, you know, on the one hand, <laughs> on the other <laughs> hand, because you sort of, your mind is now trained not to be sort of crazy one way or another. Yeah. You're actually still a journalist. Complete the sentence. I'm so glad I had my years in journalism because it enabled me to cover that. <laughs> Jane, go. Parliament Hill. Yeah. I mean, I can just go, well, and election campaigns, Tom and I have a few election campaigns that we covered together. The Meech Lake Accord. I mean, it was like, it was, it was history. I was, I was there for so much of that, and it was just so much 
fun. It was so interesting because I like the people and the power plays that were going on on Parliament Hill. That's 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 how I, I reported on Parliament Hill. Not as much on the policy, but the people and the plays, and it was fascinating. John, for, uh, people for for sure. Um, you know, I still have an incredibly vivid memory of some time in 2001, um, a, an Illinois senator who had been bombed out in this attempt to to uh, uh, to win a congressional seat, um, wanted to have lunch and talk about his new book, um, Dreams of His Father, and oh. and uh, you know whatever happened to him, was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. he turned out all right. Um, I and think that, he became you know, the 44th president. He of the did United indeed. States. He mm -hmm. did indeed. And you um, met the 45th as well. Oh, I met the 45th and 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 uh, the 43rd as well. Um, yeah. So part of it was the people. Part of it also, though. I mean, what what. What was really exciting was, was growing more conscious over time as you work through the stories and, and, and then and at a certain point assigning stories at a certain point then also kind of establishing what, what the, the whole criteria for, for news would be. Um, you set the agenda. Yeah, setting the agenda was, it, it, became, it became very interesting and also became increasingly aware of how deeply the world around me was changing mm -hmm. and how, how, I mean, we're we're funny in, the, in in that in that we actually started out in the in the mid 70s or so right at the point where there was an enormous change in the world economy mm -hmm. right that's when things changed yeah. you know you have a post war economy it changes yeah. by you know 73 74 75 it changed again you know just a couple of years ago as a result of the 2008 2009 we're now entering a new period we actually were in that yeah. in that period we lived through a, a really important moment in history so lucky us and we had a chance to become conscious of it to be players you know within it mm -hmm. we're incredibly yeah. lucky people yeah Gord, yeah. you're you're thankful you were in journalism as long as you were because oh, yeah. you got to do what everything <laughs> I, you know, I, I got everywhere. To, yeah, <laughs> everywhere. That's right. Um, City TV got to cover everywhere. stories locally as well as nationally and internationally. Uh, I, two that struck me really hard were uh, the Haiti earthquake mm -hmm. and uh, tsunami in the in South Asia. Uh, I had not consciously ever in my life considered the power of nature. I knew, oh yeah, we might get a thunderstorm or here in Canada, maybe you know a lot of snow in the winter. But when you see the power of nature at its worst, it's, it really moves you. And you know, to, to I visited a, an orphanage in Thailand where this nine-year-old boy, his name was Jimmy, and I'll never forget it, who had lost his sister, his mother, his father, and his brother, mm -hmm. and he was the only one left. And this kid was in complete shock and didn't know whether to stand up, sit down, turn around. He didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And you know, the the, the the desperation in his eyes was something that you know, really rocked me. That'll stay with you forever. Absolutely. Okay, sir, you get the last word. Okay. Uh, so I've been to eight war zones. I've been posted to five different countries. Uh, I covered, as John said, I think a defining moment of history from 1970 right into the, into the 2000s. Substantial change. Um, in chunks, I was glad that I was here to cover Bill Davis in Ontario politics because that was transformative. It made a huge impression on you as well. Um, I was glad that I was there for the 80s, particularly the year 1989, which was one of the seminal changes in our, in our human history. I was there in Berlin when the wall came down. I was in Red Square when the sickle came down. Uh, I was in you know, the last war in Europe, which was the bombing of, of uh, Serbia in uh, 1999, actually. Interviewed every prime minister since Lester B. Pearson. Uh, so when I try and refine it, that's as much as I can do to, to refine it. But in a capsule, and I can take a time count as well as anybody around here. Uh, Are you getting uh, a wind up? Uh, 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 but in a very quick capsule, uh, as John said, the world fundamentally changed in the last 20 years, and boy, did we ever luck out in covering this period in history. And we had to change, too, in the way we covered it Absolutely. all. Yeah. yeah, it was a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah. It really was. I can't, and, and if I may say for me too, these last 40 minutes, it's such a delight getting you, you four vets around this table to reminisce yeah, I and to look question. ahead. I have one question. Why is the clock in the makeup room one day off? And, <laughs> and apparently the makeup artist said that's your, you insisted on that because you bought the clock. So the question is, is it ahead or behind? It's ahead. It's ahead, because yes. we're slightly ahead of our time here. If I can steal a I line. knew he'd come up with something. <laughs> not bad, not bad. Uh, my big time thanks to uh, Tom Clark and Gord Martineau and John Cruikshank and Jane Tabor.
thanks for the memories, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you for having us, Steve. That you. was great fun. Thank you, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.